you cannot hear me, I am going to go ahead and um, take over here. Okay, good. I'm getting confirmation folks can hear me. Let me just quickly apologize. Um, we were having some technical difficulty there. Hadley, if your um, mic gets working again, log on. Until then, I am going to do my best here to do a little bit of Hadley's role, and that is welcoming you to our Washington State Ferries public meeting. Now, we hold public meetings a couple times a year to hear from our ferry riders and our ferry serve communities on issues that are important to you and to provide you updates on ferry service. This year, unfortunately, due to the restrictions on large gatherings and concerns about the spread of COVID-19, we have been unable to meet in person. Now, I wish we could be sitting in council chambers on Whidbey Island or up in Friday Harbor. I wish we were in the lovely community center at Mukilteo. I wish we were down at the great Kitsap Transit Center in Bremerton or in Vashon High School Auditorium. There are a lot of places where our team loves to come and listen and speak with you, but, but those aren't possible. And so I'm glad to see that as of this moment, more than 300 people have joined us on this online webinar. Uh, it's not our first, you know, we had a great one back about six months ago in December. So hopefully some of you folks uh, logging on today are, are repeat customers for our webinars. And I'm just so glad that you're with us and we're gonna make the best of our time together today. We're going to start with a brief uh, presentation from me, and then a panel our of our directors are going to be able to take questions. And so we will have either Hadley or Bryn as the moderator reading questions that come in from you. Now, with so many of the things these days, we're all hosting these meetings from our home. So please, we're asking you to be a little patient with us as we either tr transition between speakers, if we um, have some awkward pauses or awkward backward background noise, I think we're all hoping that our children and pets are otherwise occupied. Um, and you can submit questions anytime during this webinar by opening the panel on the right side of your screen and by clicking the orange arrow to expand your control panel. And then just type your question in the box. If you're joining from a mobile app, you can click the question mark icon to open the question field. Please keep in mind uh, that we, if you keep your questions brief, we'll have more time to answer as many questions as possible. Now, if you have longer in-depth questions or just some comments you wanna share with us, you're always welcome to send them to WSF comms, that's C-O-M-M-S, at wsdot.wa.gov. That is our communications inbox. Uh, Hadley and Bryn and folks do a great job of monitoring that inbox. And at this point, we are getting ready to kick it off. Hadley, do you want to check your mic? Still nothing at this time. So let me just jump in here. You know, the last few months, we in our communities, across our state, our nation, the world, we've really seen unprecedented challenges. And the situation continues to change rapidly. And my goal today is to update you on the status of WSF as of this moment in time. I wanna try to catch you up with everything that has happened to us in these last few months and how we have adapted as a result of COVID, and then talk a little bit about what you can expect over the next month or two. If there's one thing I would like you to take away from today's presentation, it would be this. Here at Washington State Ferries, we are not immune to COVID. In fact, uh, as countless others have done, many like you in your, in your homes, with your family, in your own work, you've had to adjust your way of doing business. And through it all, I just wanna say, we've had impacts to our service, to our vessels, our maintenance and preservation projects, our construction, to the um, ways we're able to communicate with you like today, but through it all, 
our ferry workers have been on the front lines working continuously so that customers can travel safely for their important work, medical appointments, and essential trips. Now, I cannot thank our vessel and engine crews, our terminal staff, our Eagle Harbor crews, all of our office staff who are teleworking, you folks have been keeping the system running and not without peril. I just wanna take a moment to recognize and to let everyone know that my heart does go out to a number of our ferry employees, our family members who have contacted COVID. We're, we're wishing all of you um, health and we can't wait to see you back in our ferry system. And I do wanna just take one moment to recognize that we did lose an employee quite early in the COVID pandemic to some complications that resulted from COVID. And our hearts are always uh, with, with her family. And I know many of you have experienced similar loss. And I just wanted to start by, by recognizing that. Now, speaking of how we are not immune to COVID, I meant that both uh, seriously, figuratively, and, and, and literally, you know, our impacts that we have seen have been great. I mentioned our frontline employees. Many of you out there in the communities have seen how we've been changing business, cleaning measures that we have instituted on our vessels and in our terminals, uh, physical distancing, the way we process tickets, the way we process credit card payments. We are making system-wide changes. And these are just a few. I, I couldn't even begin to name all of the changes that we have adapted to here in the ferry system, but they are all aimed at the goal of keeping our employees safe, keeping our customers safe, and keeping some level of service available for our marine highways. Now, riding the ferry does look different now. Many more people are driving on. We're asking them to remain in their vehicles. Galleys are closed. We are having riders um, maintain proper physical distancing and washing their hands and everyone riders employees wear a mask on our vessels and in our terminals now let's talk a little bit about ridership in late march our total ridership bottomed out at the lowest levels we have seen since the 1950s we were down more than 75 percent from our 2019 numbers, just about the time that Governor Inslee issued the stay home and stay healthy order. We have seen just recently a slight uptick in some of the ferry served communities, but I wanna let you know, we are still working through the Safe Start plan. And right now, um, for most of our counties, we are still in essential travel only um, restrictions. Now, where are we in ridership? Right now, um, system-wide, we are still more than 50% below the same time in 2019. So the statistics that I saw from just yesterday on uh, the 29th of June, 2019, compared to 2020, we were 51% less traffic than what we usually carry. So the graph that you're looking at now here, the blue line on this graph shows 2019 ridership for January through June. The orange line shows the 2020 ridership for that same period. So you can see what I'm talking about here, how differently things are this year. A typical year, our system is carrying a lot more traffic in early June than we usually carry in January. In fact, we're normally about 43% higher if you compare January, June, Yet this year, we're about 43% lower riders than we were in January. So all of the numbers are reversed. The, the, the ridership trends are on their head. Now, as you can see, all routes have been affected by COVID-19. That sharp decrease I mentioned in late March and a slight increase in the last several weeks, it is happening throughout our system. Now, another thing I want to mention is that today's uh, presentation uh, couldn't really be happening without a lot of the support from many members of our local ferry advisory committees. So you see their names there up on the screen. Now, these are just 
the uh, chairs of the committee and their role is to advise WSF in matters such as developing very schedules, resolving customer issues, and understanding the regional nature of what is essentially a statewide system. You can see there's contact information for all of the FAC chairs on your screen. Feel free to reach out to them directly. Provide feedback on the webinar today. Ask them any questions we were unable to answer. But one of the reasons I, I wanted to start with a recognition of our FAC chairs is the information that I'm about to share with you. Um, describing to you our COVID response plan and, and really talking you through what are the four pillars of service that WSF needs in order to provide ferry service. I first uh, shared this information with the FAC chairs in a video meeting, very similar to this one, and they encouraged me to bring it to a broader audience. They didn't just understand the four constraints on, on the ferry system. They said, you know, we think if more of our riders, if more of our community members knew about these four constraints, there would be a better understanding as to what the state Marine highway system, um, you know, what kind of spot we're in now as a result of COVID. And so with their encouragement, I want to start talking now about our COVID service plan. So in response to the decreased demand that we saw in early, um, it actually started in, in late February and then went through March, we were faced with uh, a series of, of not, um, exciting choices. We had so much service drop off that our winter schedule was really all that we could support at that time. And so one of the first things we did service planning wise, now luckily we were still in winter, this was February, March timeframe. We said, you know, we're gonna have to extend our winter schedule while we come up with a set of metrics by which we will measure the health of the ferry system going forward. For those of you who are familiar with the ferry system, you might, re you might recall that every summer we put out a summer service plan. And that's to let all of you know that when our summer traffic um, skyrockets, and it really usually doubles in the summer, we let you know how we're gonna handle the increased traffic in light of a number of factors. Well, this year, it was again, almost the inverse of this. It was our job to let you know how are we handling the decrease in traffic in addition to the variety of impacts that the COVID pandemic has brought to bear on the ferry system. And so that COVID service plan, it is available now on our website. It's in the same planning section that we usually put those summer service plans. It is there for you all to read. I encourage you to take a look at it. And I'm just gonna summarize what it says. And it basically says in order for WSF to sail its normal schedules. We need four things. We need the vessels available to sail. We need the crew available to provide those operations on the vessels and at the terminals. We need the ridership there. Of course, we need the folks who are willing to ride and to purchase our tickets. And then we need the revenue from those ticket purchases and our other budget sources to be able to support the service that we're putting out there. So those are the four pillars of service. And I wanna go through each of those four and then turn it over to you for questions. So let's start with vessels. Now, the number of boats that we have directly dictates our ability to provide service. For those of you who are familiar, you know that we normally have heavy maintenance periods in the winter when traffic is light, and then we put as many vessels as we can sailing in the summer when traffic is the heaviest. Here's something uh, that I want to call to your attention. If you, if you did not know this, when the state was shut down, when construction was shut down, our maintenance facility was required to also shut down. So over there at the Eagle Harbor Maintenance Facility, we had to uh, shutter those services for quite some time. And what that left us with is no ability to perform that important yearly maintenance in the normal period where we would do it in the winter. Now, it wasn't just the governor's proclamation um, that caused Eagle Harbor to close. On the federal side, the United States Coast Guard stopped giving us in-person inspectors 
to come aboard and certify our boats. Our boats must pass an annual exam every single year to be certified to sail. So when it came to vessel availability, our availability was drastically reduced because we have a number of vessels that are either because their maintenance wasn't able to be performed or we didn't have Coast Guard inspections happening, uh, were short vessels. So as of right now, I will tell you, we would normally need uh, 19 vessels to run our summer service. Currently, we only have 14 vessels in service. Five, five vessels are unavailable due to that maintenance backlog from having a closed facility and not having Coast Guard inspectors. Now, a bright note on vessel availability, our uh, Eagle Harbor maintenance facility was able to reopen. They are following a 30 point plan for safety per the governor's uh, safe start program. And uh, they're doing a fantastic job over there trying to get to the bat log. We also had on the Coast Guard front, we were following a system of self inspections, uh, much more rigorous than when you have an in-person inspector but just recently, we have had some luck getting a Coast Guard inspector uh, in person. And so the good news on vessels is the trend is turned around, but we still have five vessels out, folks, and we simply cannot increase service without those vessels. Let me move to the second pillar of our service. That is crew availability. So if we had all 19 boats ready to sail, do we have enough crew? We have a number of our crew members, as I mentioned in the beginning, who um, had, had tested positive, who were family members or coworkers of individuals who elsewhere had tested positive, and they have been following the protocols to self-isolate and to perform uh, COVID testing and to not come back to work until those test results are negative or until they have finished their quarantine period as prescribed by health officials. And so those crew members, in addition to more crew members who are considered high risk, the governor put out a proclamation protecting all high risk workers in the state of Washington. These are individuals that either uh, because of age or underlying health condition are deemed at a higher risk for COVID and so we are having those employees perform activities such as training, telework, uh, that can be done where they are not on the front lines, which are in our vessels and terminals. And so that has greatly affected our crew availability. And also before a crew member or before any employee can be certified as a crew member on one of our vessels, they have to go through weeks of intensive training. Now here's another situation where the onset of COVID had a direct impact on our crew availability because there's one time a year that we bring new crew into the system. We do our hiring in the winter when service is low, we train them in the spring so that they are available to be new crew members, newly certified by the Coast Guard in our system in the summer. Well, in the same way that we had to shut down Eagle Harbor, we had to shut down our construction projects, we had to shut down our training program. So normally at this time of year, we would have 60 or so new recruits entering our system. We had to wait until labor and industries had an approved training plan for us. We had to drastically change our training program. We can answer more questions about how we did that later. Instead of big classes of 20 people, we were doing classes of five employees only, all physical distancing, Behind, I don't know if any of you get my weekly update, I, I highlighted in one of my last weekly updates, all of our crew members are firefighters. So they all have to be fitted for the fire equipment. And that is difficult in the era of COVID. It takes a lot of um, new ways of doing business. And in addition, um, our fire school that we use, which is run by the state patrol, had some delays due to COVID. And so as of today, we have not graduated any new recruits into our system. Now we have some that are out there working hard. I'm really proud of you folks who are out there working hard and I'm wishing you good luck over this week and this weekend. And, and we hope that they graduate um, next week and are able to enter the system. But 
when you have the crews with COVID or family members with COVID, the crews with underlying health conditions, and all these new employees that we have been unable to train, that has created a deficit in our crewing levels because of COVID. So the third one of the pillars that we as WSF need to operate our system, the vessels, the crew, we need the riders, we need you folks. And as I shared at the very beginning, all of our ridership statistics here, even though they are on the rebound, it is important to note, they are still at historic lows. And while the governor's state safe start plan is still in place, demand for all transit services statewide are low. I'm not sure if any of you have looked on our WASHDOT homepage. We have a COVID um, data tracking special page. It is live, it is updated regularly. It can show you all of the highway traffic and how far down that is across the state. It shows you our toll roads. It shows you all the transit systems, our ferry numbers, our Amtrak cascades, all travel is down. And so when we don't have the riders there, they're not buying as many tickets as we usually have. And as long as the governor's phased reopening plan is in place, um, we expect there to be travel that is limited. In fact, just today, the State Department of Health issued a travel advisory for this holiday weekend, asking everybody to continue to limit their travel. So let's talk a little bit about funding and budget. That is the fourth pillar. That is the fourth thing we need in order to operate service. We cannot increase our level of service, obviously, without the funding to pay for it. And here's one of, you know, it's a, it's a great thing that we have a ferry service that is paid for in large part by those who ride it and buy tickets. About 75% of our operating budget comes from those of you buying tickets. Uh, the other portion comes from some state and federal revenues. So right now with our ridership being so far down, our ticket revenue is down. But in addition to that, all of our other sources of revenue, almost all of them are also down. The state just released its June revenue forecast, and this is a very important budget item that will impact all state agencies. And what that revenue forecast showed was, um, you know, $680 million of state transportation revenue that was su supposed to be there, was projected to be there, and it didn't materialize. Why? People aren't paying ferry fares. They're not paying gas taxes. They're not, they're not riding in the toll roads. So what does that mean for us individually? Well, it means a couple things. So first of all, it means that we have a huge hold in our budget, but it doesn't stand alone. For those of you who remember just last year, initiative 976 passed. That initiative took a revenue loss for the next uh, three years of another 660 or so million dollars. And so when you add these together, the cumulative impact of the money the initiative took away, and then what COVID has done to our state budget, we are looking at $1.3 billion in total revenue loss for the State Department of Transportation. We will need to address some of that this biennium, some of that in the out bienniums, and we will be looking for the Office of Financial Management and the legislature to work over the next couple months to come up with how the state DOT is gonna, is gonna handle that deficit. Now I can tell you, I do not have the answers today. OFM will be presenting options to the governor. He will be working uh, with the legislature and this will be a long process. WSF is directed um, to provide information we will submit information into this process, but until we were actually directed by the legislature and the governor, we have no cuts to make at this time. However, um, our pocketbooks are, are, are not full. And one thing I wanna remind you is that we do have state laws that only the legislature can permanently eliminate a ferry route. And the legislative session uh, next year, it will go through the end of April. And so it's possible we may not have to implement service changes until next summer of 2021. However, 
It's also possible that the legislature reconvenes early. They could reconvene this summer or August or September. And if, if they reach a deal with the governor, we could be directed to make cuts sooner. However, before we make any significant changes, WSF is also going to work with our 13 ferry advisory committees. Another important reason that we put those contact names at the front of this presentation. We will also conduct public outreach. Now, I am hoping, as I'm sure many of you are, that we, we can conduct that outreach in person, um, but we will commit to keeping these forums available to conduct public outreach if we are requested to make cuts. Now, lastly, uh, but just as important, is WSF, we still have to bargain the impacts of any potential cuts with our various labor unions that represent the workforce. Now, the governor's office, OFM, takes the lead in working with our labor unions. And so that is something that is, is ongoing. Um, those negotiations have not concluded, but any decisions um, have a number of parties that we need to work with. It's not just what the ferry system might uh, propose, it's the legislature and the governor, our ferry riders, our employees, their unions, our ferry advisory committees. All of you folks are gonna help us make decisions about the ferry system of the future. But until then, we are in a service scenario where all four of our pillars were greatly impacted. Vessels, crew, ridership, and funding. So we are essentially holding where we are in our service scenario until those factors either rebound or until we receive new direction um, from the legislature and the governor. Now, to close out here, before we get into your questions, I just wanna say a number of you may be having questions about what are we gonna do in the summer or are we gonna be able to have summer schedules? Um, I see we're, we're, we're still holding in about 330 or so folks. And so I'm hoping that most of you heard my introductory uh, item here about our four pillars. And so I completely understand that there are riders out there who want more service. Believe me, I would love to be providing more ferry service at this time, but we have those four challenges. They remain until the COVID pandemic is, is behind us. And so it will be extremely challenging for communities that rely on tourism, that are hoping visitors return. I hope that the explanation you've heard today about our four pillars of service just helps you understand the challenges that we're facing. And I hope you can come away with this. As I said before, um, we're not immune to COVID. And I don't know what type of new normal we will have, but we are not reducing service right now because of a choice. It is, uh, we have no other option without the vessels, without the crew, without the funding, without the, so, one of our metrics, this is really important to know, um, we, you know, it has been crewing. I, I talked a bit about getting our, getting our new folks trained up, and we're going to answer questions about any of that today. We may be forced in the future if we have, and I, I really want to knock on wood at this point, if we have more employees who come down with COVID and then have coworkers that then need to go and be quarantined until they have a clear test. If family members, if the county by county spikes in COVID cases, which I was just looking at those recently, and we are seeing folks an uptick in COVID cases across our state. As that continues to happen, it will continue to impact us. We may be forced to make additional future service adjustments because of lack of crew or because of lack of vessels. I, I, I cannot predict the future. I just know that we will use our four pillars of service to determine if when, when we're ready to bring services back online. And I can commit to letting you know that we will share updates with you regularly. All of you who are signed on to our customer service alerts, for those of you who check our Twitter and our Facebook accounts, for those of you who receive information from your ferry advisory committee members, we are pushing out as soon as we know things to them so that you can also be informed. So again, um, 
It's now time to uh, hear directly from you to answer as many of your questions as you can. And in addition to the four pillars of service, you know, there's a lot that I didn't mention that are all affecting us on a very personal level. Uh, for those of you who might have heard, we have many WSF employees who are on furloughs. Um, I'm going to be furloughed, our chief of staff, all of our directors, all of us who are teleworking, be they office employees or even our vessel employees, if they are teleworking, Eagle Harbor is going to have a furlough day. This was directed by the governor's office. It was in response to that June revenue forecast. Every state agency is furloughing now throughout the month of July. So folks, bear with us. Um, we may not be able to be as responsive in the month of July, but um, you know, those of us, we're, we're not just cutting our, our days at work, we're, we're taking a pay cut. And there are many folks who uh, will feel the pain from that. Other things are happening throughout, not just the state government system, but throughout all of our systems of governance. Throughout uh, America, we are all dealing, some of us on a very personal level, with combating systematic racism and the killing of black Americans. We have focused on this topic in some webinars we have done with our employees. I want our customers who are concerned about this to know that we have reinvigorated our WSF Inclusion and Diversity Committee. It's something that we started a few years ago and we are breathing new life into that committee. And, um, you know, ongoing challenges that are impacting society, it's COVID, it's everything that is happening with Black Lives Matter, it is everything that is happening with our financial crisis that we're all experiencing as a result of COVID. We are trying to juggle all of this while juggling telework and many of us trying to be as responsive to you. And so just to put it in a broader personal context, I wanna recognize it's not just our ferry employees who are having a hard time right now. Many of our community members, it is a difficult time. I, I hope that you're, you're well and I really wanna hear from you. And what can we do now? Well, we can continue to ask each other to practice kindness, to follow the rules. Um, we're asking our ferry customers to continue to only travel if it is possible, um, read through the secretary's new, new health order today. Travel is still limited and we will do everything on our end to try to keep everybody safe and to try to keep some level of service out there. And in the end, I can just thank you. I can thank you for being understanding. I can thank our employees for being frontline workers. And I can thank our customers for being there for us and for, and for really getting through this, this global pandemic with us. Now, I think it's time to take your questions. Hadley, I'm not sure if your mic was working again or if Bryn is gonna ask a few questions. I can issue here- Can you here hear me, Amy? Yes, Hadley, we got okay. you. Hey, I'm back. Sorry about that, everybody. The audio issues at the beginning. And thank you to everybody who messaged in that they couldn't hear me and were giving us a heads up and some tips on it. We really appreciate that. We're going to take your questions now. And we're going to ask Nicole and Greg and Stephanie to join us, our other panel members. And as a reminder, you can submit your questions by clicking on the orange arrow on the right side of your screen and typing your question in the box that says questions. On the mobile app, there's a question mark icon. And if you click on that, you can enter your question. We have a lot of questions coming in. So I'm gonna do my best to speed us through them and answer as many as possible tonight. If you have a longer comment or a statement or something that's more detailed, I'll ask you to send it by email. As Amy mentioned, you can always send questions and comments to wsfcoms at wsdot.wa.gov, and we'll share that email with you later. So if we don't get to your question, I'm gonna apologize in advance, but we'll start now. And I wanna just ask our panel members to introduce themselves, starting with uh, Nicole. Sure. Uh, Nicole McIntosh, I'm the Chief of Staff, been in this role for about a year now. 
Uh, prior to that, I was the terminal engineering director. I just um, celebrated my 27th year anniversary with Washington State Ferries. Okay, great, Greg. Uh, I'm Greg Faust. I'm the director of marine operations for ferries. I've been in this role for five years, but I'm a 33-year WashDOT employee. Great, thanks, and Stephanie. Hi, I'm Stephanie Sirkovich. I'm the Director of Community Services and Planning for Ferries, and that means that I oversee customer service, our planning and schedules, and our business, like our galley service and other vendors. Okay, great. So our first question is one that uh, many of you are probably wondering. This question is from someone who rides the Muckleteal Clinton route, and they're saying, is that route the only one in the system to regularly have three hour waits on the weekends and holidays? So Greg, do you wanna tackle that one? Um, so uh, sure, so no, um, you know, we've seen that at Kingston and Edmonds here, um, especially since uh, they've been down to, um, you know, one boat service the last couple of weekends. Um, so, you know, you look at a three hour wait and that's really, you know, maybe a one boat wait or a little more than one boat wait. Um, but yeah, we're, we're seeing it at, at other places as well. Okay, thanks. And this question is uh, related to the Muckleteo terminal. That's the new Muckleteo terminal. And the question is, is there an updated timeline for completion of the new Muckleteo terminal? Sure. Well, originally the terminal was scheduled to be opened in this October, uh, but as Amy mentioned, we did have to shut down construction. So now the opening of the terminal looks to be around the beginning of January, end of December. Um, we're still working out the logistics between the two contractors on site, but it's still within the next six months. Okay, thanks. And we have a lot of questions, some of which came in early on in the broadcast, and they may have joined late and not heard your remarks, Amy, and some um, more recently. So I'm just going to ask more generally, um, when can we expect to see increased levels of service and specifically second boats added back to the Bremerton and the Bainbridge routes? Sure, I can take that one. So uh, for those viewers who may not know, we are currently uh, downsized on a number of routes. I believe this question mentioned we have one boat down on both uh, the Bainbridge Island and the Bremerton routes. We also have a boat off the Triangle. We have a, a boat out of the islands because we're not sailing to Canada uh, because that border remains closed. And then we have a number of other routes who would have gone up a boat in the summer for towns in Coopville, um, and, and we haven't been adding on those boats. We also have some time constraints. We have a number of our routes up and down the South and Central Sound where we've cut late night sailings as well. So this question, Hadley, could actually be for anybody who's on any of those routes where you are either down a boat where you would normally be this time of year or you've had your hours cut. And if you're wondering, when can we restore that service? I would repeat, uh, we can restore that service when we have all four pillars of our WSF COVID service plan in better shape than they are today. And so if you, if you missed my intro, I'll just do it quickly here. We need more vessels to be back in service. We had to shut down our maintenance work at Eagle Harbor and we didn't have any Coast Guard inspectors for quite a while. So we do not have as many boats as we would usually have that are able to sail. We need more crew members to be healthy. We've had some folks impacted by COVID uh, themselves directly or their family members. We have folks who are, have underlying health conditions and who are taking medical leave at this time. We would need uh, ridership to return. I know for those of you who are riding the routes, especially on some of those routes I mentioned where we're down a boat, you're feeling those weights, but ridership is still less than 50% what it usually is this time of year. And we need that to bounce back and we need to have the funding to pay for the service. And although we have no announced service cuts because of the budget, it's something that will be coming in these next few months when the governor and the legislature convene on how to handle the massive state budget deficit that has resulted in COVID. And so the, the answer is not a date certain, it's based on those four metrics. Those are available. You can read about that in our COVID service plan. 
Okay, great, thanks. So we have a couple of questions about whether WSF is able to offer residents of islands priority boarding or a separate queue for residents. And this question has been asked a few different ways. So they're asking if year round island residents could get priority and during this time when we have reduced service. Stephanie, I wonder if that's something you'd be interested in, in taking. Well, I don't know. We've looked at it in the past, just when we've talked about implementing reservation programs on some of our routes and trying to prioritize residents. And I can't give you a definitive answer right off my top of my head, but I know that in the past we have been told um, by our attorneys and you know the attorney general's office and others that we can't do that kind of preferential treatment for a Washington resident or for a San Juan resident versus you know someone else versus a tourist. Um, and we can get back to the person who asked that question with more details about exactly why. Um, and I think also it would just be a difficult thing to administer. Um, you know, you think about the logistics of that, of how do you um, vet and prove and then, you know, have a special identification or pass for someone who's a resident versus a non-resident. Uh, I think that would be a little difficult, but um, we can get you more specifics on that. Okay, thanks. Uh, Nicole, we have a couple of questions about the mask policy and whether our employees will be enforcing masks on board or if we'll have Washington State Patrol enforcing people wearing masks on the ferries. So um, first off, our uh, employees are required to wear masks themselves, um, but we are not an enforcement agency. So we, uh, we will ask our uh, customers if they're not, if we see them not wearing a mask, um, point them to the policy that the governor has, um, has laid out and um, offer them a mask if they need one, but we will not be enforcing that policy. Okay, great, thanks. Um, this is a question, have you ever considered prioritizing travel for essential workers or instituting a reservation system for essential workers on the Seattle Bainbridge route? I can take that one. Um, yes, we've talked about it, but again, similar to the situation with the Washington or San Juan resident or you know, Vashon resident over a tourist, we found that it would be difficult to prioritize and categorize people like that. And again, you know, it would be very difficult to administer. Um, we get into the trouble of how do you define what an essential worker is and how do you qualify or how do you vet that person? Um, so, you know, we talked about it in the context of this pandemic and, and how to kind of help our essential workers move around. But, you know, in the end, our ridership, as Amy has mentioned a couple of times, is still fairly low and below levels. So we hadn't, we didn't need to really implement something like that. Okay, thanks. Um, this question says, there's a really long line last Friday at Fauntleroy, and this person saying they're not sure all those people were essential, traveling for essential reasons. Will WSF be screening for essential travel, and how would you do that? Can, can oh. I take that one? Sure. sure. All right. Um, we don't have plans. I mean, I think this kind of goes to what Amy was saying about, um, you know, I think people sort of need to participate in this as well, as Amy was saying, to um, really think about whether your travel is essential or not. I mean, we're sort of all in this together and we need to really be mindful um, of kind of what we're traveling for. And if we're congesting our roadways and congesting our ferries unnecessarily, I received a, a complaint from a customer today uh, that I was really sympathetic to uh, because it was, they were complaining that they were deterred from taking a ferry uh, because they wanted to go shopping at a yarn store, um, but they heard, you know, kind of heard from friends that it was really congested and crowded, and so they decided not to do it, and they were upset that they didn't get to take their trip to the yarn store. And as an avid knitter, I completely identify with that, and I understand when you need to go yarn shopping, um, but, you know, it's, it's maybe not the time to do that right now because we are still in the middle of a pandemic, and travel should be limited. And so we really kind of rely on our customers to police themselves a little bit. And, you know, I don't think it's our role as an agency to question people about where they're going or what they're doing, but we really kind of depend on all of you to kind of do your part in that. Okay. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, Amy, this question's related to our budget. 
is the state counting on the ferry system to help balance the budget? How is WashDOT making cuts department wide? So I would say we are not at this point counting on the, the ferry system to balance the budget. The whole in the state budget far surpasses uh, any revenue the ferry system can generate. I mean, just to give you, I mentioned just at WashDOT, just at the state DOT, we have a $1.3 billion deficit over three years. When you look at all the other state agencies, their deficit is north of $8 billion. And uh, no, these are not, that is not a level of revenue that we can bring in. As you all know, we at WSF, we, we can't raise fares. We don't raise fares. That is done by a separate state agency, the State Transportation Committee, and they do that at the direction of the legislature. So don't expect you know fares to be going up, but also don't expect cuts to happen until the legislature or the governor directs us to do those. Okay, thanks, Amy. Um, this question is, why are you running a full boat schedule on the Edmonds-Kingston run versus on the Seattle-Bainbridge run? Why is Seattle-Bainbridge on one boat schedule and Edmonds-Kingston is on a two boat schedule? So I can take that one. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're two different types of ridership um, that happens on those on those routes, right? Muckle Teo, Clinton, um, uh, Kingston and Edmonds are predominantly vehicle routes, uh, much more vehicle routes than we have walk-ons. And Bainbridge is kind of the opposite of that. That's where our, our heavy walk-on traffic generally um, uh, comes across and, and not quite the same for the vehicles. And so, um, you know, we can still provide capacity at Bainbridge with the with the decrease in ridership that we had for walk on so we can still provide you know plenty of capacity and 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 places for people to sit and still uh you know physically distance themselves from one another on that vessel um so that that was a big reason why that route was chosen um to to be downsized to house half service as opposed to some of our our heavier vehicle routes can i add to that as well because really um if you look at the ridership numbers right now, our uh, Seattle Bainbridge Island route is still total ridership is 60 percent below where it was the last week of February. So we also, you know, reduced that route pretty early on because uh, the King County routes were really the first, uh, you know, obvious. I mean, the ridership just plummeted on those routes immediately as COVID hit. So. I mean, it didn't make sense at the time to, you know, be running full service on these routes where, you know, our walk-on ridership on those routes was down like 90%, you know, vehicle ridership down 80%. So people just were not, and they're still not, you know, to those levels that, um, you know, that we've seen, you know, as Amy mentioned, you know, we're about 50% down compared to last year. But if you think about, you know, kind of the traffic that we get in February, which is a, a pretty slow season for us to still be, uh, total about 59% down on that route. You know, there's just um, the, the ridership just isn't there yet. Okay, thank you. Um, Stephanie, here's another one that you might be able to take the first stab at. This co comment says, I know it's a little early, but we're starting to plan for students to travel to school again on Vashon Island in the Vashon Island School District. We have a lot of students who ride the ferry to school. With the con current conditions now, will there be a designated area for this large group to ride the ferries and will you be adjusting the schedule to accommodate them? That's a really good question. Um, so you, I think, and maybe you can't tell from the question, designated area meaning on the vessels or on, you know, for them to sort of ride safely. It doesn't specify that. I think they mean the whole trip. Um, you know, that is something that's a really good question. You know, we work very closely with the Vashon Island School District uh, every year, you know, and we, I, I'm assuming we would be doing that probably even more so uh, this summer as we prepare for our students to join, uh, to start in the fall. Um, you know, I don't know, I haven't talked to them, I don't know what their plans are for reopening, if they're going to be doing, you know, sort of um, what some other school districts are planning for kind of a staggered uh, opening or what their plans are, but that is um, a really good question. I don't have an answer for that now, but I can tell you that we will be working very closely with them and um, we'll plan for that. 
Okay, thanks. I can add, um, I can add to that a little bit if you'd, if you'd like. So on those, on those routes, um, we, we generally are running um, Issaquah-class vessels. And even uh, currently today, you know, the capacities that we're, we're set right now for walk-ons on an Issaquah-class vessel is 300. Um, I, I don't think that our, um, our um, walk-on rates for, for the school kids exceeds that 300. I, we may get close to that, but I do not believe they exceed the 300. And that is what we're, we're allowing currently for our walk-on capacity. Okay, thanks, Greg. Um, Amy, this question is, has the COVID-19 pandemic affected WSF's plan to convert the ferries that run on the Seattle Bainbridge route to hybrid electric power? And could you give a little bit of an update on that project? Ah, thank you for that question. I love it when I get an opportunity to focus on some of the positive change that we were making at the ferry system. And that, that hybrid electric, um, actually it's a series of projects. We were looking to convert the, the vessels, the Jumbo Mark IIs that are on the Bainbridge um, run. We were also looking to build new hybrid electric vessels. And both of those projects are on track, I'm very happy to say. And here's why they're on track. They are not new boats. They're not additive to the fleet. They are safety preservation. They are state of good repair projects to either take a current vessel and upgrade it, or for the new builds, they are just replacing some of our old 60 year old boats that have either already been retired or that need to be retired. And so because those are funded with preservation dollars, um, I believe they will not be at risk for budget cuts generally. For those of you wondering what, what might a budget cut look like, I would look at the way that the governor and the legislature rep responded to the 976 initiative. You know, the ferry system, we could have taken a huge hit when that initiative passed, but the response of, of Secretary Millar at, at WashDOT, he said, you know, before we cut the things that we currently offer the citizens of the state, let's take a pause on building some new things that they don't have yet. Let's not add to the system. Let's fix what we have. And so if we take that same approach here, it's possible that the governor and the legislature could agree to take a bunch of maybe new highways or new highway ramps or new projects, if they get paused, some of our old projects, preservation of a ferry fleet, um, would continue to go on. And so we're really excited about those, those hybrid boats. We're working on them, and we really hope that, that they continue. Okay, thanks. Um, Greg. This question is, what is the ferry system doing to sanitize the ferries daily? Can you talk a little bit about what the crews are doing? Sure. So when the when the pandemic first hit and we were, um, you know, making sure that we were following, uh, you know, what the CDC was asking of us and making sure that the that the products and stuff that we were using were actually on their list. Um, and a, a couple of the cleaning products that we'd had weren't on their list and it wasn't because they didn't have the chemicals and stuff that 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 the other products did they just hadn't asked to be added to the list so some of the companies that we have our products through then went to um, get their stuff on added onto the list which they did but in the meantime we actually bought some other products that were um, you know, really kind of nice products they take less time to have to sit on the surface in order to sanitize and so um, what our crews have been doing is really a, a lot of what they've been doing all along and then more so, um, but, but in between each route, when, when people get off the boat and, and, and none of you guys are on the boat, but, but everybody's left it, the crews kind of run around like mad trying to sanitize the areas where people had been sitting or where people had been you know, playing cards or whatever it is that they're doing. That's why a lot of the areas on the boat you see are cordoned off. Um, one, it's to help provide this physical distancing. And it's also to provide a smaller footprint for the crews to be able to go in there and sanitize those in between each of those sailings and get it done and try to keep the boats at least somewhat on time. Um, on the other side of that, with the reduction of some of the service that we've done um, with this kind of less than winter schedule that we're operating on and cutting out some of those late night sailings, the crew is still there on the boat. 
um, their hours haven't changed. So what that did was that really provided at the end of the at the end of the a service day, it, it provided a crew to be able to take some time and actually really sanitize the entire vessel from top to bottom and have it really ready to go for the for the morning crew the next day to just start kind of wash, rinse and repeat. And we do this on every boat um, every day. Okay, thanks, Greg. Um, we have a number of questions here, and Greg, maybe you can start with this response about why the ferries in the San Juan Islands have been running late recently, and we have a specifically questions about why they tend to run late um, toward the end of the day. Could you address that and some of the reasons why we've been seeing uh, sailings running late and alerts going out about that? So there's, I mean, there's a number of reasons why boats can run late. Um, you know, some of them are have to do with loading. Sometimes, you know, if you get lots of, um, you know, people with elevator access or lots of people that want to have their vehicle near a restroom because they're staying in their cars and they're staying on the car deck. Um, you know, sometimes it takes a little bit longer time to process that, that, that sort of stuff. Um, additionally, you know, we just know that our winter schedule in the San Juan Islands is a really, really tight schedule. It, it was taking that limited amount of service that we provide in winter and just packing as many trips in there as we possibly could in order to keep that service. And so, you know, we generally struggle to keep that particular route on schedule even in January. Um, and, you know, as you start seeing ridership pick up, um, it, it's, a, it's a little bit more difficult to keep that thing uh, on its schedule and and keep it running, but there's there's any number of reasons why um, you know vehicles run late, stalled cars, um, you know, because people are staying in their cars. Um, I've heard some anecdotal evidence from our crew members that they've had to jumpstart a lot more cars than normal because uh, maybe people are on those long voyages listening to the radio or whatever. But all those things take and add just a little bit of time each time, and there's really not a lot of dwell time. When dwell time is what we talk about when the boat gets into the dock, that time from when it arrives to the dock to the time that it leaves the dock, those dwell times on a lot of our routes system-wide, not just the San Juan Islands, Bainbridge is another prime example of dwell time issues. Um, they just don't have the time in the dock um, that they really actually need. But, uh, you know, this is something we've been dealing with for, I mean, at least the five years I've been in the office. Okay, thank you, Greg. Um, this next question is about, again, just how the decision will be made to increase service when we get to that point. Have you considered that ridership will not go up if the service and ferry runs offered aren't adequate? In essence, you're forcing Bainbridge residents to drive around and they would be wanting to take the ferry if you added more service. Amy, do you want to start with that one? Oh, uh, yeah, I'll start. We have talked about that in our planning department. We've talked about sort of um, elasticity and demand and all those really boring topics about how, you know, there is that sort of fear of if you cut service, then you're going to deter people from using that service because it's not as convenient or helpful. Um, so we have talked about that. I mean, we are just in a position where at this time we can't provide the additional service that we want to provide. I mean, we're just too constrained. Uh, like Amy talked about those four pillars. Um, and, you know, the governor has talked about the safe start, his safe start plan for reopening the state. And he's described it as, you know, the turning of a dial, not the flipping of a switch. And I think that that's how we're really trying to approach service right now, because, um, you know, we are still in this very fluid situation where we are, you know, going back and forth and trying, you know, we have all these different metrics that we're looking at. And as soon as we can, as soon as those four pillars align, as soon as we have the crew, the ridership, the vessels, the funding, you know, we're going to increase that service. I just can't predict, I can't tell you what date that's going to happen because there's just, this situation is still evolving. And so, unfortunately, I wish I could give you more uh, predictability there, but I just can't at this time. Okay, thanks, Stephanie. Um, this question is related to the Fauntleroy Ferry Terminal in West Seattle. Um, are you able to do something to help alleviate the traffic mess at Fauntleroy that's been caused by the West Seattle Bridge closure and specifically cars trying to enter and exit the ferry terminal? Greg, do you want to tackle that one? 
Sure. So I can start with that. So, um, you know, we've been working, you know, really hard with um, some of our partners to be able to provide uh, law enforcement service or at least uniformed officers that are there to help um, at many of our terminals. So um, just so you know, um, on the 2nd of July, we will have um, a group called Puget Sound um, Executive Services will be there. They are off-duty law enforcement. Uh, personnel, and they will be there um, Thursday, Fridays, and Saturdays um, to help alleviate some of that stuff. And it's, you know, I'll just go ahead and expand on this a little bit. It's it's really pretty cool. So we've got um, this contract with them that's brand new. They will also be providing service for us um, at Edmonds. They'll be, or excuse me, Kingston. They'll be providing service for us at Bainbridge, and they'll be providing service for us at Muckleteo. Um, so this is a, a really cool new opportunity um that that you know really allows the state patrol to do what the state patrol does and it and it brings in this other group of people to help manage our traffic but you know as far as the bridges is, is concerned you know and nicole i don't know if you want to jump into that because that's a that's that's not really um it's not really ours right i think actually you address the, the question um which was okay. what are we dealing with the, the traffic now at the dock but okay, I can, thanks. you know, because I know the question might be out there, and I can simply say this, when it comes to the ferry portion of the traffic that may or may not take the West Seattle Bridge, something to, to really do here is to put it in perspective. So in general, if you take all of the traffic that comes onto Fauntleroy from either Vashon and, and Southworth combined, the majority of that isn't headed for the West Seattle Bridge. Based on our, our last rider survey, um, the majority of that traffic, about 60% of it, right, Stephanie, is headed either to stay in West Seattle or headed south down in the Kent Valley uh, to their jobs down there. Only 40% of the traffic that we bring on our ferries into Fauntleroy, only 40% of that is heading either into downtown Seattle or north. Now, what is that amount when you compare it to the total traffic on the West Seattle Bridge? It's only between 1% and 2% of the total traffic that bridge carries daily. So there's a lot of questions about, you know, can we reroute a ferry? Can we repurpose our terminal? Just keep in mind, we, that's only 1% or 2% of the traffic. And so, yes, we are engaging with SDOT and the water taxi and all the folks, Kitsap Transit with the Coast Guard, we are engaging with folks. I've got five different offices at Washington State Ferries who are each on a different working group to help with West Seattle Bridge. Just the vast majority of the traffic isn't, isn't coming on a ferry and so it's hard, to, it's hard for us to play an outsized role in solving it, but we're there at the table. And doing things like posting more uniform officers are, are definitely things we can do that are going to help. Okay, thanks, Amy. Um, this question is, what type of metrics um, for demand did you look at when creating the COVID service response plan? And this commenter says, the ferry line in the San Juan's been all the way back to Commercial Avenue in Anacortes this weekend. So they're asking how the decisions were made to cut service in the San Juan's when they're seeing such long lines at Anacortes. Stephanie, do you wanna start with that one? I can talk about, so the metrics as far as, um, can you repeat just the first part, the metrics about the ridership and how we kind of, how what we looked at when we devised the COVID response plan, is that the- Yeah, the metrics the, for demand they're asking. Well, certainly, I mean, ridership was obviously, you know, the, the first thing that we looked at and we, um, I start my day every day uh, poring over ridership statistics and looking at where we're at and looking at where we're going. Um, you know, we have also been talking to, I mean, it's not just purely ridership. We've been talking to employers in the Puget Sound region. We've been talking, uh, reading articles, talking to other transportation planners and people across the country. I think one of the challenges is um, through this COVID pandemic, we don't really know, we can't predict with certainty what ridership is gonna do. And this is a problem with transit agencies across the country. I think, you know, ridership uh, nationwide dropped by about 75% uh, on average overall. And so a lot of uh, transit agencies are struggling with this and trying to look at metrics and trying to figure out um, 
how they can, you know, calibrate their service. So, you know, we're looking at a lot of different things, looking at things like unemployment rates to see, you know, because certainly employment drives a lot of traffic and, you know, has a, a very tight correlation with ridership. And, and so we're looking at a number of things to try to, um, to, you know, kind of assess where we're going to be, but really what it all boils down to, you know, if you read that COVID service response plan, um, it boils down to those four pillars. I mean, that's really at the base of, of you know, that's, that's our operation. We need, you know, those four things to be able to operate, you know, and have those four things aligned. Um, what was the second part of the question? Was it was specific to the San Juan okay. Islands, Hadley? Yeah, I wonder if, Greg, that was a bit operational. They were asking this weekend specifically what was happening up there. And some of the, and many things were happening up there, right, Greg? I mean, we have, yeah. uh, they're down a boat. We're not sailing to Sydney. We had some stalled vehicles that I read about over the weekend that were causing delays. Um, at one point in time, we had a technology glitch that I believe affected reservations and our IT department is looking into it and our director of IT is going to give us an after action report. Those are just three things off the bat I can name. Greg, were there a few more operational things? It is our most complicated route uh, in our system because we have so many destinations we serve just out of Anacortes. Greg, anything else specific to this question? Uh, so, I mean, Sunday we had a we had a boat that really it got severely delayed um, for for a number of reasons. It ended up getting really severely delayed. But you know, when you start looking at and what we're seeing, so you know, I think what we've heard already on this on this webinar, um, Fauntleroy, uh, Edmonds, Kingston, Muckleteo, Clinton, um, the San Juan Islands, Islands. Mm -hmm. Bainbridge Island. Um, this is They're essential awake. travel. This is essential travel. Right. And there and there's weights at these places that are only supposed to have essential travel. Um, and so I guess we're trying to figure out what the essential travel levels are um, and, and why essential travel is so much busier on the weekends. OK, so we have another some, somewhat related question. This one's about the Makotio Clinton route. Why was the decision made to reduce the Makotio Clinton route to one vote? this past weekend when it's the busiest time of the week. And they're saying, seems like you should emphasize service on the weekends over weekdays. You know, let me take that one. It was where Greg just went off, you know, he is your weekend travel, is that the essential travel or is the Monday through Friday travel the essential travel? Um, that's, an, that's an interesting question before us, but it wasn't, uh, I think the question was, why did you make the decision to cancel? We didn't have a decision we had no other option. We had um, enough crew members who were on leave that day, sick that day, um, had COVID related restrictions that were in quarantine on that route um, that we didn't have the crew to sail it. Greg, anything to add to that? Yeah, so we have what we call an operations. We've, we've hit the wall, so you have um, you know, all of our all of our labor unions, um, they have um, their vacation benefits, their, um, you know, vacation accruals, their comp time benefits, all this stuff. Um, they have to use them if they get to their anniversary date and they haven't used that, they will just lose their vacation. Um, and so we get to this point where, um, you know, folks have deferred vacations and things like that because of, you know, where they're going to go in the middle of a pandemic in March or April or May. You know, now we're at that point where these folks are actually, um, you know, taking their vacations and we have, um, you know, like the maximum number of people allowable that are out on vacation right now. And, um, you know, we can't deny that stuff. I mean, this is their this is their um, bargain benefit um, and and they're taking it. Right. And so, you know, you have that plus all those things that Amy mentioned, uh, they all compound on one another. And we've we've just we've just run out of bodies. It's really as simple as that. And because we didn't have the new graduates from our training program, because COVID required us to shut down our training for the spring, um, we didn't have the new inject of folks. So it's really all of those things together. Okay, um, going back to the governor's stay home, stay healthy order, and Amy, you talked about one of the four pillars is vessel availability and how. We had to pause our maintenance for a while. 
This question is, if essential businesses were allowed to stay open and the ferry system seems like an essential business, why was maintenance and work on the vessels um, shut down? We were following the governor's order that all uh, maintenance construction activities around the state were shut down. I mean, there was a period of time where um, all of construction was shut down. Nicole, do you have anything to add to this? I, I will add that um, when we did experience vessel or terminal breakdowns, in order to maintain the service that we were providing, our Eagle Harbor staff was um, was dispatched to fix those items. So we weren't completely shut down, uh, but our Eagle Harbor staff was then um, maintaining our essential travel. But again, even with that, you know, with the social distance requirements and all those other things, it wasn't like you could send a fleet of Eagle Harbor people out there to do this stuff. You were sending like maybe maybe one employee, or if you were lucky, you were sending two that could do the work in a in a in a way that was safe. Okay, Stephanie, this is uh, related to reservations. Is WSF still holding a percentage of available reservations to be released 48 hours um, before a sailing in the San Juan Islands? Uh, we do have our reservations are available online and they do, they are following the two day, two week, two day reservation release, the tiers. Um, the only catch is that unfortunately you cannot call our customer service center and make reservations over the phone, uh, unfortunately, because um, because we're all working in these remote situations and because we've, you know, maintained our, you know, teleworking for self, uh, safety and health purposes, we can't, our customer call center agents cannot take your personal, your credit card information over the phone. They're at their homes. We just don't have the setup to do that. There's a lot of strict regulations around compliance, financial compliance and your personal information. So. We can't take reservations over the phone, unfortunately, but they are available online and we encourage people to go online at takeaferry.com. You can make reservations as you normally would. You can call our call center if you need help, if you wanna be walked through, they can walk you through the process and you can do it yourself, but they just can't take your credit card. Okay, thanks, Stephanie. Um, Greg, this question is how big is the deficit for crews right now? And I think the commenter means like how many crew members do we have out on leave and how many crew members are we down from where we normally would be? So if we just look at the vessels themselves, um, you know, we're over 150 people that are out, um, out of our system, just on the vessels alone. That's not including our terminals. Um, so, you know, those those folks are, are out. Um, uh, again, you've got, um, on the on the deck side, um, you're you're upwards of about 80 people that are out every day on either vacation or or their comp time leaves, those kinds of things. Um, and you know when we're when we're trying to fill these jobs, like just I'll give you some inside baseball here for this weekend. Um, you know we don't have all the positions filled for this weekend yet. Uh, and the weekend's almost here, but we don't have all the positions filled for the weekend. And we can kind of estimate that there are people that, that get sick. There's people that may get COVID. We hope not, but they may, or they have family members that are sick and, and, and they need to care for them. So, uh, you know, we just, we, just, um, we just don't have the people. We have like nine people available right now um, for over 20 jobs, and that's just for Friday. Okay, thanks. Um, two questions here that are related, so I'm just going to ask one of them. They're very similar. If WSF is an essential part of the state highway system, why are we shutting down service um, when we do not shut down our highways and we haven't closed any roads due to COVID-19? Amy, do you want to address that? Yeah, well, I would say you don't need a crew of folks to operate your highways. I mean, you need a crew of folks to build them, but most of our highways um, they, there's no operations aspect to it. And so we are operating uh, a marine highway, but we're doing it with um, humans and big pieces of machinery. So the vessels and the crew can both be impacted in a global pandemic. And I think, you know, if you were on earlier, you heard about uh, our inability to get a bunch of our maintenance done. The Coast Guard wasn't providing us inspectors so we couldn't pass our annual exams um, for our 
vessels to be certified to sail. And with our crew, you know, unfortunately, we have a number of individuals out on leave. Uh, they are sick. They've been sick. They have a health condition. They are, and, and our goal, really our goal here is to protect safety above all else, the safety of our crews and the safety of our riders. So yes, we are an essential service and the governor has issued proclamation <laughs> directing for vulnerable people to be protected in this COVID. And so we have to do both. That's why we're not fully shutting down but we're providing some level of service on all of our domestic routes while we can also protect those crew members who need to be protected and while we can also catch up on our vessel backlogs that were shut down we're trying to do both i know it's not perfect um but i would i would posit it's better than shutting down entirely okay thanks i'm going to pause and just let everyone who's with us know that we're making our way through questions we do have a lot of questions that have been submitted but if you have a question now would be the time to send it in we're going to keep going until 8 p.m and we'll get to as many questions as we can and uh the next question amy is can you explain why wsf is charging the peak season surcharge when service has been cut below winter service levels and while the governor's directive is to limit travel well, the, uh, for those of you who missed it earlier, I reminded folks that we Washington State Ferries do not set our fares. The fares are um, set by a separate commission, the Washington State Transportation Commission, and they actually set those fares last year. They generally set them a, a year or so in advance, and they are setting fares based on direction from the legislature. And so that direction came not this legislative session, but last year's legislative session. And so all of these decisions were made by um, bodies that are not WSF, and we have no authority to roll back those fares. So that would be a, a question for the, the commission, for um, the legislature, but in general, they directed those fares to be set and, and we're charging them because we are directed to. It's, it's not our decision. Okay, thanks. And uh, another question related to fare box and fares. Um, average transit system across the US fare box recovery is about 35%. Why is WSF held to such a high 75% fare box recovery rate? That is a great question. And I'm going to see if Stephanie wants to chime in. Um, you know, our fare box recovery has, has, fluctuated over time. That number, that 75% number, that's a fairly recent number. There were times before the first uh, Tim Iman initiative, which happened almost 20 years ago, where we didn't charge as much. But an initiative passed the population and it cut ferry funding. And so we were directed by the legislature to increase our fares. Um, Stephanie, anything you wanna add? Um, that too much because I'm not the expert on fares and uh, on my staff and on my team. But I do want to say that you know we aren't legislated. We aren't given a fare box recovery target. It's not like they mandate, oh, you need to recover 75 percent or 70 percent of what your fares are. It's more like we get a revenue target from the legislature, and it's usually in past years it's been about two and a half percent increases. And so then, you know, the Transportation Commission and our staff kind of go through this process where we kind of figure out what that two and a half percent means. But it's it's not, I think it's more incidental that the recovery happens to be uh, 70 to 75 percent. And that's based on these um, revenue targets that were given. I mean, it will be interesting to see, you know, we just submitted uh, a forecast, uh, you know, where our uh, projected ridership and projected revenue are, are much farther below where we thought they were going to be um, in February, the last time that we made these projections. And, you know, we will see what happens with fares and with all of that uh, going forward. I mean, a lot is up in the air. And as Amy said, a lot of it is uh, not really up to us. Okay, thanks, Stephanie. Um, Nicole, maybe you could start this one and Greg, you can 
chime in as well. This one says, regarding the crewing shortage, has WSF reached out to other uh, maritime companies and other credentialed mar maritime professionals to try to hire them and bring them on to fill your crew shortage? And would there be people that don't require extensive training that you could bring in to work and fill the gaps? So, uh, well, first of all, uh, we are in a hiring freeze. While we do have essential employees, uh, Amy talked about um, our process for hiring. Those folks that um, we identified as new recruits, um, you know, kind of came in before that hiring freeze went into effect. But what I could say about, um, we have specific, and Greg can talk to this much better than I can, but we have pretty specific requirements to be a Washington State Ferry employee. Um, no one, uh, to my knowledge, uh, has those exact requirements to come right off the street unless they have retired from Washington State Ferries. Greg, did you we want to add? We have to have pilotage, right, Greg? Well, that's for our officers, right? So the officers would need pilotage and, and things like that. And that's- You have to be a firefighter. You know, and, yeah, you have to be a firefighter and you have to know how to use our equipment. Some of our, our equipment is very specialized um, that we have on board. It's, it's much different than what you may find on other ships. And, uh, and and so we like to make sure that we train our people that are going to be part of that firefighting team, that they train with our equipment. You know, the other side of this, uh, kind of what Nicole was saying is that, you know, with this hiring freeze, you know, we made conditional offers um, to 65 new deck employees um, and and I think 35 new terminal employees. And those those conditional offers were made before the hiring freeze. So so we, we have these folks that, that we've made offers to. Um, and we've just been not been able to provide the training. And so, you know, this was kind of our first stab this last two weeks to get this first group of, of literally nine people um, to, to get through a training program that was supposed to have been done before this weekend. Now, because of the issues we're having at fire school will be done after the weekend. And, you know, kind of looking forward, if this, if this thing all works out and we're able to actually bring on more of these folks that are there, kind of the next group of folks that are that are in the queue to come in, um, that group has licenses, right? That group has, you know, unlimited AB tickets. I mean, these are really experienced credentialed people that are the next group to come in. Um, so, it, you know, as we move this thing forward, um, you know, these folks are gonna be really helpful. But it's still those folks, even with the credentials that they have, and will still need to go through our two week program. Yeah, we have different steering systems. I mean, you have a quartermaster or an AB that's coming in off the street. You know, maybe he's worked on a tug. Um, you know, I, I don't know where they've worked. They could have worked on a fishing boat and gotten an AB ticket. I mean, you're coming on to some boats that range anywhere from, you know, a brand new build with really super modern technology and articulated rudders and things like that, or, or onto a boat that's 61 years old and operates completely differently. And, and they need to have to understand how those systems work, how we do our commands, how our bridge teams function, um, how to load cars. Because if they were working on a fishing boat, they weren't loading cars. If they were working you know, anywhere else, they probably weren't loading cars unless they were on a car carrier. And that's very, very different um, because we're not lashing them down and, and driving them on one at a time. You know, we're, 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 we're playing in traffic uh, you know, trying to get cars um, from point A to point B. So there's a lot of things that they need to learn that that's just unique to, to, to the ferry system. Okay, thanks. And this is a somewhat sort of follow on related question. Is WSF expecting the crew shortage to extend until there's a vaccine for COVID-19 or when do you expect these work workers to return to work? I don't think any of us could could assume um, what may or may not happen vis-a-vis -vis the vaccine. What we are doing now is we are following Governor Inslee's executive orders. Um, one of his orders that, that offers that um, age and protected health status to a number of our employees is currently set through August 1. So I would expect that some of the crew will maintain uh, COVID leave status through August 1, but then it's up to the governor. We have to see how our entire state is doing combating the virus. We have to see if all of our uh, new infection rates are going down instead of up. Uh, you know, I can't know what, what the governor uh, will do in the future with regard to trying to protect vulnerable people, um, but 
we know that probably through August 1, it will be an issue. Then we need to look at when we can bring more training online. I mean, both Greg and Nicole, and we've mentioned our first class is out there training in small groups. If we can keep small groups training throughout July, we'll have an inject of people. Um, but right now, we, we're just getting a clear picture of what we think will happen in July, which is we will have crew shortages, we will have uh, vessels not operating at their uh, even full winter schedule. And we hope, we can all hope that by August, everything's looking better. But it's up to all of us in the state to do our part in following the health orders and only traveling if it's essential and all wearing our masks and all, you know, it's up to all of us. So um, that question is almost like saying, how do we think Washingtonians are gonna handle the month of July and uh, all of our health orders? I hope we all follow them. Okay, thanks. Stephanie, a follow up to a question that you answered a few minutes ago about how folks can make reservations right now and um, how we're not taking credit card numbers over the phone. And this commenter says that some people don't have the internet. So if the credit card number is the issue via the phone, would it make sense to waive late fee charges? So we have not, we've suspended any kind of no show fees on our reservation routes. And that's been the case since COVID hit. So right now, um, you know, we still, you know, we encourage you to make a reservation and keep your reservation and cancel your reservation if you don't need it, because you know, we do need to, especially as more and more people are traveling, we need to be able to plan and, you know, not have a bunch of people make reservations and then not show up for their reservation. And then, you know, there's all this space that could have been used by other people wanting to travel. Um, you know, I think you can call our customer service number 206-464-46. Oh, I'm not getting, call 511. <laughs> I am not remembering off the top of my head. But call 511, <laughs> and that's much easier to remember. And you're, if you're within the state of Washington, call 511, call our customer service, our call center. And if there's a problem, um, you know, they might still be able to help you out. Um, but, you know, as far as uh, making reservations over the phone, I mean, if you don't have internet access, maybe you know somebody who has internet access who can help you. Maybe there's, you know, some sort of way that you can do it on, online. So, um, you know, that's kind of my best advice. I'm sorry, that's not a not a really great answer, but that's the best I can do. Okay, thanks, Stephanie. Um, Nicole, can you give us an update on the Coleman Dock project and the replacement of the Coleman Dock terminal? And then specifically, another question is, is there been any adjustment to the timeline due to COVID-19? So um, what I can say is that, you know, we did suspend construction on Coleman um, for COVID. But what I can say is that the contractor has been able to reshuffle some work um, and order since the timeline was out in 2023, we still think we'll be able to meet that 2023 timeline with the reshuffling of work. So that's great okay. news. Thanks. And then another question uh, on a project, kind of not directly COVID related, but what is the status of the fifth Olympic class hybrid electric vessel, Amy? Well, as I said earlier, you know, we're still really excited about these new hybrid electric vessels that are being built. Uh, work is going on at Vigor Shipyard. So work is underway. Um, you know, a, a big tranche of that work was already funded in the current budget. And we need, of course, additional funding to come through. But that vessel is is underway. It also, you know, Vigor did have a slowdown during uh, the early onset of COVID. And so there were a few months we were really hoping, we were hoping to have a keel laying ceremony by the end of this calendar year. I think it'll be next year sometime. Um, but that vessel is is underway. We're really excited about it. Great. Thanks, Amy. Um, what is WSF doing to increase communications around um, giving people advance notice when ferry service will be impacted? And especially this commenter is saying, could you give us more than 12 hours notice? 
You know, that's, we, we would love to, I mean, certainly when, I mean, we would love to give you more notice. Uh, when we know of an issue that is well in advance, for example, whenever we have a, you know, a, a catastrophic vessel issue, now everybody knock on wood, right? We have not had a complete uh, engine propeller shaft breakdown this summer yet because of a crab pot entanglement. But if something like that occurs, we know how many weeks it'll take to fix the, fix the vessel and we can move boats around to adjust. When it comes to much shorter term items, like Greg mentioned, um, we still know that as of today, we have not filled all the jobs to sail all of our schedules for this weekend. We have to balance allowing our labor unions and working with our employees to call and try to get folks to come in off of overtime we have to balance that with giving our riders notice if we're going to need to cancel. And so one thing I want to commit to everybody on this call, we are going to take a look at all of our metrics and we are going to try to make decisions about service for a month at a time. So we know this crewing issue is here. I believe it will be difficult to fill all of our shifts through July because as I mentioned, the governor's executive order providing this specific type of COVID leave runs through the end of July. Rather than every single weekend, you know, biting our nails and, and seeing if we're gonna, we would rather make a decision a month in advance and let everybody know. So stay tuned, we are working on that. Uh, Stephanie's service planning team, Greg's operations team, people have been providing input. The vessels team was instrumental in trying to look at the month of July and ask, let's, let's take a look at those four metrics, those four pillars of service just for July. How many vessels do we have available in July? How many crew? What's the ridership look like in July? What's our funding look like in July? We will be making a month long decision coming soon. Um, so stay tuned, but we're still putting kind of some of the final inputs into that, into that plan. Okay, thanks, Amy. Um... This question is about multi-ride passes. Is there, a, does WS have the ability to extend the time to use the multi-ride pass with the reduced travel, it makes it really hard to use all the trips in three months. Stephanie, do you wanna answer that? Yeah, you know, we looked at that a couple of times, actually, our, um, you know, we worked with our customer service, worked with our revenue control department, our accounting department, and our IT department. Um, we looked at, you know, possibly extending, uh, time periods, validation periods, you know, extending, and, and we just a couple of times looked through it and came to the conclusion that we couldn't really change the dates on those. Um, back when this all began, we were offering refunds to people um, who, you know, had purchased passes kind of prior to COVID, then COVID hit, and then they were not able to use all of their passes. At this time, um, I think we are, and I am not the uh, revenue control department, so I don't make those decisions, but I think at this time, you know, we are hoping that people will just kind of buy what they need. Um, I know that that makes it a little more challenging and, you know, you don't get as much of a discount when you have a multi-ride pass, but, um, you know, at this point, I think that people should sort of have a better sense of how much they're going to be traveling and how much they're going to need. So um, the refunds, I think, are now, uh, I think we're kind of passing out of the period where we would be giving refunds for unused uh, travel, unused tickets. But, um, you know, that's just my best advice. You know, try to purchase what you need. Um, you can certainly contact, you know, go to our website and there's a place to request a refund for unused travel. But, um, you know, it, it's really at this point, you know, it's if you're having to purchase a ticket at a time, that's sort of the best way to go. Okay, shifting gears a little bit back to the budget, Amy. Does the one plus billion dollar figure deficit that you mentioned include all of WASHTA and other WASHTA areas in addition to WSF? It does. It was a $1.3 billion deficit over the next three years, and that's for all of the state transportation system. So that includes ferries and the and the roads and the and the rails and everything. Okay, this question is again about service. 
as different counties move to phase three, where essential travel is allowed, will WSF be increasing service to those areas of the system? So again, uh, we, we cannot make a service decision based on only one metric, which is ridership. We, we make those decisions based on our four metrics. It's not just ridership. We need to have the vessels available. We have to have the crew available and we have to have the funding. All four of these items have been negatively impacted by COVID. As long as we are in this pandemic, as long as we are across the state, not fully open, the ferries will not be fully open. And I understand there are folks, you know, getting excited about moving from phase two to three or three to four. Um, I see the governor recently came in and, and put a halt on a lot of the county movement, right? And and now we have the Secretary of Health putting out a new order today, asking folks to really restrict travel for this weekend. Unfortunately, and I'm not a health professional, but when I read the newspaper and I look county by county, our cases are going back up in Washington state. And um, I understand we want the economy to rebound, but we have to have our health rebound first. And right now um, we wouldn't be able to increased service for only some part of our system. Remember, we're a statewide system. We need um, you know, the green light from the governor to have all of our employees safely return to work and the other four pillars to, to have a bounce back. Okay, thanks. Greg, a question about testing um, employees on the vessels. Is WSF able to get COVID-19 tests for ferry workers? to the extent that you need them. And I think maybe they're just asking, are you testing workers on the vessels? So no, we're, we're not testing workers on, on the vessel. Um, you know, these are essential employees. I mean, if they're, if they're showing signs and symptoms, um, there are several facilities around the state where they can go and get testing. Um, but we're, we're not, we, we are doing temperature checks on our employees. So that is one thing that we're doing is that we're making sure we have a series of questions that they're asked every, every day before they start their shift. Um, and they get their temperature taken before they start their shift, because we want to make sure that the employees, um, that we're putting on the vessel are healthy so that they do not contaminate other employees and exacerbate our problems. And so that they don't, um, you know, infect any of our customers that may be on board and, and exacerbate that problem. So that that is what we're doing, but, but testing, no. Okay, um, this question is, if we must cross from say Clinton to Makotio, for example, where can we find specific information about current wait times? Stephanie, do you wanna address that? Can you repeat that, the beginning of that question, Hadley? Sorry. Uh, this commenter saying, if we must cross from Clinton to Makotio, for example, but this would apply to all routes in the system, where can we find specific information about wait times? Um, well, you can look at our website. You can look at Vessel Watch, which will give you kind of real time information about where the vessels are. Um, you can look at our um, you can look at our website for best times to travel. I would say just you know go to the Washington State Ferries website. You can also call customer service too and Again, I remembered the number now, 206-464-6400. <laughs> I did know it, um, but you can also call 511 and uh, ask for that information. You can also okay. sign up for alerts, right? We have alerts, um, so you can sign up for alerts and we'll send those little alerts right to your smartphone. Um, you know, generally our Twitter account, will put um, those types of things out on our Twitter account as well. So there, there are many places that you can go to find that stuff. Yeah, I would second that to sign up for the alerts or follow at WS Ferries on Twitter. So that's sort of real time information that we put out. Um, this next question, Greg, is with only one ferry running on the Muckleteal Clinton run, why is the docked ferry kept running all day when it's tied up to the dock in Clinton? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by running all day. The engine's running. Uh, well, okay, so there's certain things on the on the plant that need that need to be run or there's certain maintenance that has to be done there. You know, every one of our boats has what's called an emergency generator and those emergency generators are required to be run for four hours um, every week. Uh, so and generally those things are done when the boat's not necessarily in service because they're kind of loud and they're, you know, usually around where public areas are. 
Um, so there's any number of reasons of what possibly is running on there. Um, it's, it's probably not their main engines, but you have to realize that even on those boats where you have these, these two large main engines, there's, there's actually several small um, uh, D70s or diesel 70 engines that, that operate many other things on the boat, refrigeration, I mean, any number of other things that are on the boat that those smaller, what we call the hotel loads, um, are runoff of. So uh, you may be seeing some exhaust that's coming from one of those, probably not a main engine. Okay, thanks, Greg. Um, this question is, of all the vessels currently out of service, are any of them available as a backup in case another vessel breaks down? Yes, we have a, we have a, a vessel log that actually is available that will show you what our backup vessel is at this time. I don't have it memorized. Greg, um, you're- I, I, I got a little bit. So so right now it's it's the Kits app and the Kits app yep. is sitting at Bainbridge Terminal right now, um, but it, it it's having some maintenance issues. So I know that while it is was sitting there, it was actually in maintenance today uh, or, yeah, today, I was trying to remember which day they furloughed. It's all running together, excuse me. Um, uh, so they were doing some maintenance on the Kitsap today, but but that vessel is currently right now, I think our only standby vessel. Um, and we have several vessels that um, are projected to come back sometime in the month of July um, to, to give us a little bit more uh, reserve in the system, um, but uh, right, yeah, right now, I mean, as of today, we didn't have any, but but we will have the kids app. Okay, so we're nearing the end of our time. Thank you to everyone who's kind of hung in there with us. I know it's late at night and everybody's tired. So I'm gonna ask a few more questions. And then again, we will be posting a recording of this meeting and you can always submit um, questions by email and we'll get back to you that way. Um, this next question is uh, from one of our FAC members, actually, from Fauntleroy, and he's asking for an update on the Fauntleroy Terminal Replacement Project and some of the plans to replace the Southworth Terminal. Can you give a little bit of an update on that, Amy, or Nicole? Sure, I can go ahead and take that one. Um, so, of course, the Fauntleroy Terminal Project was supposed to be in heavy uh, public engagement right now. Uh, but as, as we're in these restricted times, we've really slowed way down on the public engagement. So what we're really doing, um, and based on you know, ridership from 2019 versus what we're doing today and versus what, what we can predict is going to happen in the future, uh, we're taking some time to really uh, think about that. So we're, we're looking right now at um, what it is that we need to do, which is preserve the terminal, make sure that the terminal itself can be uh, withstand some seismic forces, um, and look at the operational issues that that, that, that little terminal serving two routes uh, has today. So we're gonna be slowly trying to engage the public um, in a safe way to um, work on that project, um, but we're, we're not meeting the timelines that we had established a year ago because of the COVID. Uh, regarding Southworth, um, that is still a project that is on the books. We um, have recently worked with Kitsap Transit to uh, apply for and I think receive some federal grants to move uh, uh, a joint project there on Southworth uh, along. But again, that's, that's a little ways out. Um, and again, that would require some pretty extensive public outreach. Okay, thanks. So we're nearing the end of our time. I'm gonna do one more question that I think encompasses sort of many of the questions we've gotten tonight. And um, I wanna also say that those of you who submitted suggestions or comments that weren't a specific question, we are capturing all of those. We're gonna share them with all four of our directors who are on the webinar tonight, as well as the rest of the Ferries executive team. So just know that your comments are heard and they'll be captured and shared with the relevant staff. But this final question is, uh, Amy, can you just summarize for us when we can expect to see service increasing this summer? We've had a number of questions about when boats will be added to certain routes, when more service will be added, when the lines will get shorter. So if you could just sort of summarize that all at once. Sure. So as we are in this time of massive change, 
we at WSF had to go through a lot of changes ourselves as related to COVID. One of the things we've done is we have moved away from changing our schedule based on a date on a calendar. So if this were last summer, I could have given you the date, right? Um, this summer, because of COVID, we cannot change any of our schedules going forward to increase our service unless one of our four pillars of service, all four of them actually are improved. Those are, we need to have more vessels available for service. That will happen when we get more time at Eagle Harbor to maintain our boats. And when we get the Coast Guard giving us inspectors back full time, we need to have our crew back in place. That will happen um, when we get over the hump on COVID and our um, protected employees aren't as um, susceptible to COVID, that will also happen when we're able to bring on new employees. We've restarted our training program. We had to put that on hold because of COVID. So as we get uh, more employees back into the system on uh, ridership, you know, we, we still, I know it feels like ridership is going up and it is. We are still 50% below where we normally are this time of year. And then there's the budget issue, uh, which is hanging over all of us. You know, $1.3 billion for our state to make up in transportation lost revenues uh, is not gonna come easy. And so when we have all four of these things aligned, and it's not a date when, it is when we have more vessels, more employees, uh, more ridership and more funding, that's when we can increase service. And I apologize that I cannot give you an answer like we did before COVID, which, which was a date certain. Um, I understand for those of you who are looking for an increase in service, uh, that's not the best answer, but it's the answer we have. And so I'm trying to be transparent about just giving you the facts as we have them, not trying to sugarcoat them. I'm trying to let you know that COVID has drastically impacted us and it's impacted us in more ways. You know, it's not just that we have some vessels out of service and some crew who are unable to work because they're sick and they should be taking time to get well. Um, and it's not just because our ridership is cut in half and our funding has taken a huge hit. Other things are happening. We're all furloughed. We were told recently, both the State Department of Transportation and the State Department of Health have let all of their office employees, folks like me and Nicole and Greg and Stephanie, we're all to be teleworking through the end of this calendar year. So they're not even expecting in an office setting, we can return to normal in the, in the year 2020. So trying to put more service out there when we don't have the ridership we usually have, we don't have the fair revenue we normally have, we don't have the vessels we normally have, and we don't have the employees we normally have, it's not gonna happen. I, I, I would hate for anybody to, to leave this webinar thinking they're gonna get some service um, I am more concerned about the opposite happening. I am more concerned that COVID is getting worse out there, that we are having more employees get sick, and that we're gonna have even less ability to run our current schedules. And we will likely be cutting more service as we go through July. Hopefully by August, we can turn it around. Um, I'm sorry for the grim answer. You know, I'm usually a half cup full type person. I like to be positive and, and energetic. And uh, it's a tough time, you know, leading North America's largest ferry system in the time of the biggest global pandemic in 100 years. It's hard on the customers that rely on that ferry service. It's hard on the employees who staff that ferry service. And so until we are all safe, until we are all recovered, until we are all through this, none of us is through it. So I guess this is a, a good question to end on, a question to just remind um, my fellow employees, to remind my um, elected officials who, are, who do such a great job advocating for their constituents, we do not have the resources to operate the normal summer schedule we have. We ask for your understanding. We're being honest with you about it. We're being transparent. We've published our COVID response plan. Go online and check it out. Work with your Ferry Advisory Committee executives. Uh, we had their contact information up there. If you have ideas for us, 
we're not just here to you know be a naysayer we're here to listen and get ideas from you um if there's way we can do business differently if there if there are ways we can adapt we will take those considerations and build them in um, to our decision making and ultimately we will need you we will need your help and guidance as we as we hear from the legislature about whether or not we need to take budget cuts we need your help and guidance as we continue to struggle to you know keep our our marine highway system running um so thanks for participating thanks for your questions thanks for listening today and, and thanks for understanding you know we, we we are not immune to covid great thank you amy and thank you everyone for joining us today we're going to leave you with the email address where you can submit more questions or comments if you have them and again we will be posting a recording of tonight's meeting on the website tomorrow and we'll send that out by route alert and we'll post it on twitter and some of our other tools so you can share that with folks in your community who may not have been able to join the meeting tonight and you can refer to it but um, that's all we have for this evening any other closing words panel members just okay, thank well, you just thanks thank for joining you. us stay safe thank you stay safe thank you everybody